And now a little more history, also from an era that people don't want to forget, but for very different reasons. There's a woman who lives in Kirkwood who heard stories growing up that she began to realize were meaningful and important beyond her own family. And if she didn't write them down, they might be lost. And so, she wrote them down. It's been nearly a century and a half since the practice of slavery was abolished in the United States. But to this day, many aspects of slavery are not commonly known. For example, while abducted Africans and their descendants made up the bulk of U.S. slaves, people of other ethnic groups, including Native Americans, also fell victim. The book Melindy's Freedom, the story of a slave family, tells the tale of one such person. Melindy was a member of the Cherokee Nation, illegally enslaved at the age of seven by a Missouri farmer. People just walked around in your presence and when you were serving them and everything. And Mildred Johnson of Kirkwood is the author of Melindy's Freedom and Melindy's great-granddaughter. Johnson says Melindy's story is family oral history. It was passed down to Johnson by Ellen Buckner, Johnson's grandmother. Buckner, too, endured slavery for part of her life. She had just beautiful hair and I would comb my hair and, and braid it. And, she said during the Civil War, they had to knit uh, socks and, and sweaters and little things to go to the, uh, to the uh, soldiers. They would be up at night, and then she, if they would get sleepy like that, she said that the mistress would break all broom straws and prop her eyes open. Guys, so we tell their things whatever they were doing. Missouri law did not recognize marriages between slaves and free men, but Melindy's master allowed her to marry Charlie Wilson, a free man of African, Irish, and Native American descent who sold herbal remedies for a living. His earnings contributed to Melindy's support, but he never earned enough money to buy freedom for his wife and the five children they eventually had. It was always tough on Melindy when Charlie went on the road, but it was a cause for celebration when he returned. They would make molasses candy, and my grandmother would make sugar cookies. Uh, uh, Melindy would make sugar cookies and things which they loved and all like that. They had good times. They had happy times. I don't know how my mother walked her trouble down. The selling of slaves often led to families being ripped apart. But when Melindy was sold to a Gray Summit man, all of her children went with her. She made a skirt out of a, what my grandmother called a gunny sack. That's what she called it. And she made slits all in it and said, now, if we ever have to go, y'all will hang on to me. I will not lose my family. You know, this would, no matter what they do, don't y'all turn me loose. And that's what they did at the auction box. It would upset, which really upset them. And she stood firm with that. The publication of Mildred Johnson's book coincided with the exhibition, Captive Passage, the transatlantic slave trade and the making of the Americas. It presents a maritime perspective of the slave trade through hundreds of artifacts, art and other objects. When you take the students through here and you show them this mural, and then you show them the African that's negotiating to sell other Africans, do you get any response from the students? Are they surprised? Um, absolutely. Um, one of the first things that people um, ask about is, well, why didn't those Africans, they have guns, why didn't they do anything um, with those individuals right there? And that's one of the key things that we stress right here, um, because there's a common misconception that Africans sold their own people into slavery. These are not the same groups of people. Yes, they're all Africans because they all live on the continent of Africa, but um, they're Yoruba, they're um, Ashanti, or so on and so on. They're not considering themselves the same people. 
Africans throughout time have um, always um, divided themselves up amongst uh, amongst groups and sometimes they got along and sometimes they didn't and European traders knew these relationships and they would um, they would go to groups that were not getting along and um, purposely trade things for them like guns and liquor and things like this um, and have one group capturing um, other groups of people. These are actually um, guns that were used on the the decks of ships in the um, mid 1700s actually so these are these are the real thing no reproductions here and um, the interesting thing is that these guns are actually facing in the wrong direction usually on a ship you, these guns would be facing towards the hole that we just came from because when individuals were brought up on deck to be exercised, if you will, so atrophy would not um, be set in. In a typical way that they would be exercised, a drum would be played and they would force the people to dance, if you will. And so this was the prime time for a rebellion. Um, sometimes the rebellions would be planned, people would communicate these below decks, and other times the rebellions would just be spontaneous, kind of like the riot effect. And you see one thing happen and it snowballs, and so these guns would be loaded with things like nails or a rock sword or something like that that would not kill an individual, just wound them and be loud enough to scare everyone else to suppress the rebellion. Listen to these words. I think most people think of slavery in relationship to cotton, but this right. is sugar. Yes, this is sugar. Actually, um, cotton is a very contemporary crop when it comes to slavery, just towards the um, late 1700s, um, early 1800s. Actually, sugarcane was the number one crop, and so most Africans were brought to Brazil. As a matter of fact, about 37% of all um, Africans that were taken from the continent of Africa went to Brazil. Um, less than 10% came to the United States and the death rates on these plantations were really high because people were literally um, being worked to death. You're talking maybe four or five or six years and then people were dying because the labor was so intensive. The valued skills of other slaves saved them from working the fields. This comes from South Carolina actually and legend has it that the man who made this jar was enslaved. His name was Dave. Um, Dave the Potter is what he, um, what he was referred to. So I believe his last name became Potter. He was um, owned by several individuals but he worked in a small town in South Carolina that were responsible for producing jars. And um, much like other jar makers at the time, this gentleman wrote poetry on his jars. Now, the first thing that comes about is that I thought the slaves weren't allowed to read and write. It was against the law? It was against the law in many places, but this gentleman obviously had um, skill in, in writing, liter literally um, writing. Some people believe that he worked as a typeset. Um, years before he started making jars and so he had to learn how to read in order to do that and so on his jars the poetry that he would write on here um, um, some very humorous some rhyme verse and some actually um, depicted current events that were going on at the time like this um, poem right here was done around um, eight in the um, late 1850s and if you can look really closely the poem on there says a pretty little girl on the verge volcanic mountains how they burge and some people believe that this was in response to the excavation of um, Pompeii. Ways that people escaped, especially in the islands, um, people just moved off up into the hills um, in the Carolinas and um, they didn't always go up to Canada. They would escape out to um, small islands or go south to Mexico if they were in Texas. Anywhere you could go other than the plantation. So running away was a common form of escaping. And so some people would use the networks on the Underground Railroad and, and get to Canada. Other times people would take it upon themselves and get very creative about the ways that they um, escaped. Right here, um, this prime example right here, Leary Green, who was enslaved um, in Baltimore in the 1850s and she actually escaped to Philadelphia, which um, did not have slavery at the time, by shipping herself basically in a trunk. If you don't mind, since other people can step in here, I'm going to try that. Sure, absolutely. So she's in here for 18 hours. She 18 has hours. A, she's got anything with her? Pillow. Uh, a quilt, a pillow, a bottle of water, and a little bit of food. 
And she can't say anything because she doesn't want to reveal herself. So she has Absolutely. to be totally silent totally and silent. still mm -hmm. for 18 hours. Right. Oh, gee. This is scary. Obviously, she was not a claustrophobic. Let me Obviously see if you can not. even close the door. Gosh, people have grown over the years, haven't they? Okay, close it and we'll see how long I can stay on this. I think that's about hours. as long as I can stand it. Is she saying she wants out? I want out. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. No more auction black for me. Freedom for all Missouri slaves finally came in December of 1865 after a constitutional convention Governor Thomas Fletcher's executive order and the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. That's nearly three years after the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect. The Cherokee Melindy was 45 years old. She died in her early 50s. Today, an estimated 600 people can trace their lineage back to Melindy. Mildred Johnson hopes her great-grandmother's story will give readers a greater appreciation of the sacrifices of all slaves. Well, if they could go through all of this, surely, surely, I can do better than I'm doing it. I'm going to move on for a better life for myself.